So in this lecture, I have defined some experiment, for example, flipping a coin. I have sample space S consisting of all the possible outcomes, for example, heads and tails. And I have also defined an event, which I call A, which is, remember, just a subset of the sample space S. So this event could be, for example, getting tails when you flip the coin. Remember that an event can be either true or false, depending on the actual outcome of the experiment. If that particular outcome is in the event, we say that it's true, otherwise it's false. So that means that there must be a probability of a certain event to be true or false. If I flip a fair coin, for example, the event getting tails would have a probability of 50%. So we use the notation P parenthesis A to denote the probability of the event A to be true. It's equally common to denote this probability by PR A. Being a probability, this P of A must be a number, and it must be a number between 0 and 1. Here's another example. Our sample space S is 1 through 6, perhaps representing the sample space of tossing a dice. And I have an event A, which is getting an outcome, which is 1, 2, or 3. That's an event. So I can denote the probability of this event A to be true as P of A, or PR of A. But since A can be denoted using this set notation with curly brackets, it's equally correct to write the probability like this, where I have put the collection of outcomes that are included in the event inside curly brackets. So keep in mind that when you use this notation P with the parenthesis, the only thing that can go inside this parenthesis is an event. You cannot put anything else inside the parenthesis of P. And then you can think of P simply as a function which returns the probability of that particular event. So let's start thinking about the problem of how to determine these probabilities. A common method is to apply to the principle called equally likely. For example, if you flip a coin and the coin is fair and the person flipping the coin isn't using some kind of trick, then it would be reasonable to apply this principle and say that heads and tails are equally likely. Having only two possible outcomes, the probability of each outcome would then be 50%. So to generalize this idea, let's say that our sample space contains a finite number of possible outcomes. 2 in the case of flipping a coin, 6 in the case of tossing a dice. If you're willing to assume that each outcome is equally likely, then we can calculate the probability of every conceivable event. For example, let's say that we toss a dice which is symmetric and we toss it in a fair manner, then it would be reasonable to assume that each outcome is equally likely. It's just as likely getting a 1 as it is getting a 2. And since there are 6 possibilities, the probability of getting a 1 is 1 over 6. But we can also calculate the probability of any event. So let's say that my event A consists of 1, 2 or 3. Well, as A has three outcomes and the sample space has six and each outcome is equally likely, then the probability of the event A must be three divided by six or one half. So we can generalize this idea. So let's say that your sample space contains n elements. n is six in the case of a dice and two in the case of flipping coin and you want to calculate the probability of an event that has k elements, where k must be a number between 0 and n. k was 3 in the previous example, 
Well, then the probability of this event is precisely k divided by n, if we're willing to assume that the outcomes are equally likely. This assumption, of course, is crucial. If you toss a loaded die, then the outcomes will not be equally likely, and you cannot calculate the probability of events using this formula k divided by n.